Kate, your expectation around Federal Reserve interest rates, I mean, as Mike was saying, it's not Bullard's base case 75 basis points. What are you expecting? I think the Fed, the 10 year is oversold. I'd be buying at this level. I think the, the, the appropriate rate should be more like two and a quarter percent. I don't care what he says. Despite all this talk about inflation, long term, we've been in a 20, 25 year deflationary trend. So I think the market's getting ahead of itself. Now, the Fed can do what it wants. They're the marginal buyer. They have the biggest balance sheet and they can make the rates whatever they want them to be. But I just don't think the fundamentals support anything near uh, the three, three and a quarter percent tenure. Okay, Kate, but let's talk about the Fed's reaction function, not just where the bond yield should be. Do you not think that they are far behind the curve here as we see the IMF joining the chorus today and hiking its inflation outlook? I do not. I think that we, we get in our little um, chattering classes. Everyone's talking about inflation. Remember, a year and a half ago, no one wanted anything to do with oil. Now we're saying oil is going to be $150. So I think we, we get in these um, uh, modes. We're all talking the same thing, and we, we go in, a, in one direction. So I, I'm going to be a contrarian on this one. I, I think that as things play out, you will see that there are lots of deflationary trends in the U.S. economy. The economy is strong. The, um, the credit markets are strong. I am, I'm going to hold on to my position on this one. Okay, Kate, that's really interesting. Over what kind of time horizon are you talking about here? Because, yes, you're right that, that, that a lot of voices seem to just be talking about inflation, whether that's Western central banks or many of the guests and strategists we talk to, and inflation has been underestimated by central banks, and central banks are behind the curve, has been the dominant narrative. But there are increasing numbers of warnings, and the downgrades to global growth from the IMF and the World Bank are those, increasing numbers of warnings that, uh, that perhaps we're going to need to focus not on inflation, but maybe on growth in the second half of the year. So what kind of time time horizons are you talking about? I'm looking at, I'm really looking at the next two, three quarters. Look at what the companies are reporting. We're just getting into reporting season. Bank of America reported yesterday. I listened to the call. They reported strong loan growth, deposit growth, client inflows, and they made some very interesting comments. The size of the economy is bigger than it was in pre-pandemic levels. Consumer spending remains strong. Credit is widely available. Customers' usage of credit lines is low. Synchrony Financial also reported. So there, there are a number, JP Morgan reported. So yes, gasoline prices are up 22%, but the consumer is in good shape. I, I, um, JP Morgan, uh, Citigroup, credit card spending is up 29%, 33% for Wells Fargo. So I'm looking at what the companies are saying. Okay, so Mike, let's bring you back in here because speaking of what the companies are saying, we've heard from your interviews with Fed presidents really across the board that the companies in their districts are telling them, hey, we can exercise pricing power. We have the ability to pass these costs on and that creates actually a little bit of a problem for the Fed. If we see the continued ability of companies to do that throughout this earnings season, does that not just reinforce a hawkish Fed? Well, it does to a certain extent. The Fed is finding that a lot of companies are saying it's getting easier to find people to hire. Mm. It'll be interesting to see the next jobs report won't influence the Fed decision because it's two days after that. But uh, if we are continuing to see the labor market heal and uh, start to rationalize, then the idea is we will probably see a little bit of a slowdown in, uh, in, in wage growth and pay growth, and uh, that will help as well. Uh, I think that uh, the idea that uh, we look too far ahead for recession is true. The yield, remember yield curve inverting uh, like a couple of weeks ago and uh, we were having mm. question, the yeah. daily question Didn't is are we gonna long. have a recession? <laughs> and Jim Bullard said he doesn't think we're going to have a recession, even though he wants to raise rates significantly above what neutral is. So uh, we're going to go back and forth on this in the markets, and the Fed is going to try to ignore all that as much as possible and try to focus on what's happening in the economy. Yeah. Uh, and Mike, thinking about what we heard from, from James Bullard around 75 basis points, not his base, base case, as, as Kaylee rightly points out, uh, but something that he was asked about and he didn't want to rule out, uh, what purpose does it serve for Fed presidents to, to, to make that kind of comment? There's a concept in politics called the Overton window, where you sort of open the, uh, the framing of the debate to, to wider territory, and it helps to normalise things that might have been at the extremes previously. And I just wonder whether that's what might happen here. You know, you talk about 75 and it just makes 50 look more expected. 
Yeah, somebody was pointing out uh, this morning, Anna, that at the beginning of the year, we were looking for four rate hikes from the Fed. Now we're looking for as many as 10. So uh, it, it does uh, fit into the widening of possibilities as inflation has gone up. There's just so many wild cards out there. You have an almost recessionary forecast for Europe coming down from the IMF and World Bank because of the war there. How does that play out around the world? And what does China's slowdown because of the lockdowns mean for the global economy? And how does that rebound back into the United States? It's yeah. really hard to say uh, that something is going to happen. I, I think Bullard is just specifically honest when he's asked a question, but as he said, it's not his base case, so he's not out promoting it the same way he is promoting the idea of a 50 basis point move at the next meeting and getting to three and a half. All right, well, Kate, Mike brought up a lot there. War in Ukraine, the outlook around China, just a lot of uncertainties that this market faces. In that kind of environment, where are you putting your money, whether on a regional level or on a sector level? Uh, in that environment, I'm putting my money in the U.S., Okay, there's been a lot of talk about the U.S. no longer losing its status um, as a reserve currency. I don't see this happening. The euro has proven itself to be unstable as a currency. Look, what, look at Brexit. Look at the French elections. The euro could even fall apart. China is highly unpredictable, you know, on the, on the government level. And then you have this war in Ukraine. I think the U.S. is a great place to be. Look at the U.S. dollar yen exchange rate. Mm. Trading at the yen's at a 20 year low against the US. US raising rates is pulling in money from all over the world, the carry trade. I think all of this is going to be favorable. The US dollar continues to be strong. I think it'll remain strong. And lastly, I'll say very quickly look at the Silicon Valley. Anything you do in the world, you have to touch Silicon Valley. I call it the Silicon Valley tax. They levy a tax. You want to go on the internet, you want to date, a, date someone, you want to buy airline tickets. US is the place to be. And what, what is your latest take then, Kate, on the, on the earnings story that we've got from the U.S. so far? We haven't got all the way through, we haven't got that far through uh, the earnings season. But what kind of messages are you taking away in terms of appetite to load up on stocks? Because some talk about the U.S. equity market in particular as being pretty expensive here. U.S. equity market is expensive. I think we're going back to, you know, what's the alternative? Where are you going to go? Yes, the 10-year, I'm going to repeat it, the 10-year at almost 3%. That is an alternative. I think that is, that's why I'd be a buyer of the 10 year, not a seller. Long term, if you're a buy and hold long term investor, I think you have to be in tech. Medium, short term, energy is looking good. Alternative energy, very good. Defense and cyber defense. Look at a Z scaler, a Palo Alto, a Fortinet. These are areas CrowdStrike. You're mm. seeing what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. Those are areas that are very attractive. Kate, just quickly, a final question as we're going to start seeing big tech reports with Netflix after the bell today, a number over the next week or so. How do you differentiate in technology between what is maybe too expensive and what is not? It, very easy. I would buy the big, the big ugly fangs. I, I think they're <laughs> the place to be. Uh, Google, Microsoft, and they're not Amazon. They're not that expensive. And then you have these companies that are still going to be around. They're very real, but they're trading at 10, 20 times revenue. <laughs> Those are the ones to avoid. Uh, yeah. I would stick with the, the big ones.